and the threat of a nuclear bomb. Right? All of these things are stressful, <laughs> to share the least. And so we want to talk about them. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about why I do this and who I am. My name is Gus Lock Tawan, and the name of my company is 911 Seminars. In 2005, I wrote this book. It's called 911, the Red Book for Emergencies. The 911 actually stands for 9 11. On 9 11, the worst disaster ever to hit Hawaii hit the island of Kauai, where my wife and I lived at the time. Does anybody remember the name of that hurricane? Oh, there's so many young people here. Iniki, okay, it means piercing wind. 9-11 is also the date when the Twin Towers fell because the planes flew into them. And that's why I wrote the book. Those two traumatic events changed my life, and because of that, I do these kinds of things. I try to uh, explain and provide more information so that people don't panic in these times of disasters. Okay? I was the first to sponsor symposiums on the bird flu when the whole state was concerned about that. Right? I was the first to start doing active shooter training until about three years ago, then everybody got into it because every time you turned around, there was another active shooter event. And so on January 13th, when the false alarm of the nuclear event came up, people that know me and what I do started calling. I got calls from all kinds of schools and churches, and now shopping centers are trying to call because all of their stores don't know what to do. Okay, so what we're trying to explain to all of you tonight is if you have this information, I want you to share it with all of your family and friends. Don't go home tonight and hold all of that stuff that you might have learned. Share it with your family, share it with your friends. We get a lot of calls from principals that tell us that w when we did our program, this was back in November and December, we were already doing the nuclear threat training and some of the faculty and staff immediately knew what to do that Saturday morning, and they helped their families go through those 38 minutes of trauma. Okay, let me share some stories with you now. But first, let me ask a couple questions. How many of you were sleeping on that morning? Can I have a show of hands? Don't, no, don't be bashful now, you know? How many, I see, okay, good. You missed the whole thing, right? And you're blessed for it because you didn't suffer that trauma. Let me tell you from firsthand experience with people telling me this. These are the kinds of things that people went through. Coaches. Training young students on the ocean how to canoe paddle. When they got that text, they left the kids. They left the kids. Coaches teaching young five, six-year-old students how to play soccer on the field. When they got the text, they abandoned their kids. Something that you would think would be unheard of, but why? Do people do that because they were in a panic? This is what panic does to people. You do things you ordinarily wouldn't imagine that you would do. Okay, so let me explain to you why that panic set in. Many of us are parents. I see some of you with your little children. Some of us, not too many. I don't see too many old people in here our grandparents, but you all have that primal fear, and the primal fear is this. If there's danger, our first natural instinct is to protect our children. 
Do you agree with me? First natural instinct is to protect our kids or our grandkids. And if we don't have the right and correct information in our brain, we go berserk. We panic and we do stupid things like people jumping in their car, driving 100 and 120 miles down the freeway, zinging in and out, thinking they're going to pick their children up 20 miles away in 10 minutes. Now, can you imagine what would have happened if that person driving that car wildly got into an accident, got killed, and killed other people on the way, and then, lo and behold, we find out it's a false alarm, and his children were safe. What would that do to that person's family and his loved ones? How many of you saw the gentleman putting his children down into the manhole? Probably not realizing that by doing so, he endangered the life of his child who might have died from the chemical hazards down in the manhole. You know, nobody goes down there unless they've got a mask. Those are the guys treating it. Chemical hazards, methane gas, rats. And that was the solution? Panic. Panic makes us do foolish things. We're going to try and show you how you can get away from all of that trauma and all of that panic. I want you to take out your map. You all got a handout. There's a little map on it. And it looks like this. On your map, it might not be in color. <laughs> so I want you to look at the sheet. And, and before I go to that, I want to preface it with my um, doing what I call my anticipation of this crowd. Okay, so in this small little group, 10% of you have the attitude that if we had been attacked by a nuclear bomb, there would be nothing we could do about it. We would all be dead. Okay? And so your action plan, this is your action plan, do nothing. We don't have to. We're all dead anyway. Okay? But on the other side of the aisle, 10% of you probably think, why are we even talking about it? It'll never happen. Kim Jong-un will never do that. So what is your action plan? Do nothing. So finally, we, we have the extreme on the left and the extreme on the right agreeing with the same action plan. Do nothing. But 80% of this audience and 80% of all of the groups that we've been talking to, they have a lot of concerns. They're worried. And their major concern is, how can I keep my loved ones safe? Okay. We want to show you, and I'm going to ask you to do this. In all the world, in every single country across the globe, what is the most famous destination in Hawaii? What is the name of the place everybody knows about Hawaii? What is it? Waikiki, you're a tourist. Okay. But in all of the world, what is the most famous place? Pearl Harbor. Why is that? <laughs> we had the war, right? We had the big attack on Pearl Harbor. So of all places in, the, in Hawaii, Pearl Harbor is the number one famous thing. So where do you think, if you had to pick the top three places, if Kim Jong-un 
did send something, what would be the top three destinations he would choose? Number one would be Pearl Harbor, right? Okay, so let's move the circle to Pearl Harbor. Can we do that? Yeah, there it is. Right there. On the map, that red dot is known as ground zero. What does that mean? On the map that you have, on the right-hand side of the map, it says Oahu. Under Oahu, there's a drawing of a length of distance. What is that distance? 10 miles. Using that as a guideline and comparing it to the red dot, where the dot on your map is in the center, and here the dot is in the center, how big is that red dot? Anybody? About what? What's the diameter? This is not a math class, you guys. <laughs> Take a guess. About a mile. Okay. Now I'm going to make you feel real good. For those of you who thought the nuclear bomb would wipe out the whole island of Oahu and the island would sink into the ocean, the red dot is the total space area that the nuclear bomb coming, and we're going to show you what size and all that kind of stuff, would destroy. One mile in diameter. Compare that to the map of the island. One small mile. One small red dot compared to the total island. That is the total area of destruction. Okay. So I hate to make you who think that if the whole island was going to be destroyed, I don't want to make you feel bad. But, but it's not. It's only the red dot. Okay. Around the red dot, there's kind of an orange circle. Here it looks limey, right? Lime green. That area around the red dot is going to be impacted when that explosion goes off. It's going to be like a combination earthquake, hurricane at the same time. Boom. Earthquake, shaking, ground trembling, buildings falling, structures demolished, fire and explosions. Cars with gas are going to explode. Water heaters explode. Windows and doors blown out. Can you survive that? Yes. Can you escape uninjured? Yes. How do you do that? Where do we go? Inside. Get inside. Do not stay outside. You need to get inside, and we'll show you how to do that and where to go inside, wherever you are. Now, the big circle. It's got a, got a green outline, the heavy green. Five mile in diameter. What's happening in that area? Heavy, serious radiation. Okay. Can you survive? Can you get away without any injury? Can you get away without being contaminated? Yes. How do you do that? Stay inside. Get inside. Stay inside. Who lives in Pearl City? Does everybody here live in Mililani? 
No? Where do you live? Waipahu. Does the circle hit Waipahu? No. Does it hit Eva? No. It doesn't hit Pearl City. So if the bomb did explode at Pearl Harbor, where is the best place on the island to live? <laughs> Look at your map. North Shore, West Side, East Side. <laughs> North Shore, West Side, East Side. <laughs> and why is that the best place to be? Because I'm going to show you this next chart. Al, can we go back to the PowerPoint? I want to show distance, and then we'll get into the shelter. Okay. <laughs> Looking at our PowerPoint now, you're going to see something that will make you feel even better. Right? All right. There you go. Thanks, Al. Where ground zero is, the farther away you are from ground zero in distance, the farther you are away from ground zero in time, the less impact any of that radiation will have on you. Okay? Let's go to the next one. There you go. Less time spent close to ground zero, greater the distance away, and look at the third. The better the shelter building you're in, the less impact on you. What is the best type of building to be in? Concrete. Does anybody here live in a concrete building? Anybody here live in a condominium complex? One of those high tower, high story? No? Nobody? You all live in wood houses? <laughs> you do? That's okay. That's okay. We'll show you how to do it. Go to the, here you go. <laughs> we have, last night we did one where everybody lived in a high tower. <laughs> high rise. Get into the middle of the building and as low as you go. Okay. Where is the middle of the building? Some of these condominium towers, probably the stairwell. Three or four story house or building, same thing, get into the middle. Stay away from glass windows, glass doors. Get into the middle, get down to the bottom. Live in a single story house, get in the middle. Okay. Never get in your car. And if you have pets, make sure they're indoors. Okay? Next one. It's another shot of high stories and where the best and safest places to go are. Next one. Thanks, Al. This one should make you feel even better. We're getting happier every time, right? Now, you have this image in your mind. I know you do. And I'm going to try and answer all the questions you might have to dispel those misconceptions, and they are misconceptions. You think that the radiation is going to kill us because it'll be here for generations. We can never escape that radiation. So lo and behold, you're going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this. After seven hours, seven hours, all of the radiation released by the atomic bomb will dissipate. I see some surprise faces. I see some unbelieving faces. I'm not making this up. This comes from Department of Defense, Homeland Security, and they base all of these findings on actual data that we got from the only recorded Instances of an atomic bomb dropped in a civil, uh, civilized population, and that was in Japan. Okay. 
after two days, 99% of the radiation level dissipates. Two days, 99% of it is gone. So here's what you're thinking. You're thinking about instances where a nuclear reactor leaked. Nobody knew it was leaking. And for years, it possibly, that radioactive leak seeped into the ground, seeped into the water table, and all of a sudden, all these people that were living right next to that radiation leak started coming up with birth defects, all kinds of cancer and uh, physical ailments, and then it was traced back to that radiation. Okay? The atomic bomb we're talking about burst up into a cloud, and then it falls back down to Earth like dust. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it, but it's there. But after seven hours, it dissipates. Not the same as in a nuclear reactor. Or, for so, some of you might have seen the documentaries on the Marshall Islands, the Marshallese people. And if you know a little bit about history, the United States tested nuclear bombs over years, right after World War II, we started doing it. And I believe we had 68 nuclear bombs that we tested underwater, in the ocean, and for years, the Marshallese people were infected by that radiation level, and that's why we come up with all these horror stories of how so many of them came down with all kinds of uh, diseases and birth defects and uh, all kinds of deformed animals on land and in the ocean. But that was after years and years and years of radiation level. Okay. Not talking about the same thing, but you have that image in your head, and that's why some of you would rather, instead of living with that radiation, you think you would rather have a quick death okay. because of that image. And so I want to get that out of your head. That's not what we're talking about with a nuclear bomb from Kim Jong-un, right? You have these handouts, and I want you to take them home and read them and share them with people that you love and you want to make sure they're not uh, overstressed. Uh, I, I heard some people still can't come out uh, they, they're locked in their room and they won't come out. Um, we're going to be doing some workshops for them, and this is actually on the base. They were so traumatic. You heard what happened in Walmart? I don't blame the people at Walmart. I don't blame the staff. I blame the management because they never told their staff what to do. So the typical reaction was in a calamity, in a crisis, you lock down. Right? So they kicked people out of Walmart, and it comes to find out there were quite a few elderly people that shop early Saturday morning, and guess how they got there? They didn't drive, they got there by bus. Okay. So they kicked them out, and they're in the parking lot on their hands and knees, praying because they're expecting that bomb to come in 10 minutes and they're going to die in a parking lot and they can't reach their loved ones. Okay. Kick them out into the parking lot. Okay. There was a father who dropped his son at the airport. And as he was leaving the airport, he got the text. He went into an emotional turmoil because he couldn't figure out, should I go pick my wife up at work downtown, or should I go back home where his two younger children were staying there because it was Saturday morning. Okay? He couldn't make a decision. My wife? 
or my young kids. He had an emotional breakdown. And as he's driving on the freeway, he gets the text from somebody on the mainland, false alarm. Okay. That's when he exploded, and that's when the rage grew. And uh, you can understand, when you're in that trauma, the rage. How many of you read Lee Cataluna? Maybe you don't know who she is. <laughs> She's a columnist for the advertiser, and she's usually pretty mellow. You know, she writes funny columns that people read and kind of laugh. Right? But after this event, she was on a terror. She wanted everybody fired <laughs> from the top down. She just, you're, you're out, right? Rage. And so what we're doing here tonight is we want to bring the rage down, we want to prevent the anger, we want to prevent the panic, and we're trying to give you as much information as you can and that you can share to make people realize we can survive. We not only can survive, we can escape unhurt without any injury at all if we do the right thing. Get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned because you need to find out what to do and when to do it, and we're going to show you, okay? Next couple of pages. Here's something that I get really upset about when I hear somebody on television talking about something you don't know anything about. And some of them tell you, you got to get into the shelter and lock it down and not let anybody in because you don't want anybody coming in to contaminate you. Anybody hear that? Oh, good. I'm glad you didn't. And then they got even worse, and my wife went into a rage when they said, you, you can't let your dogs in. If they were contaminated, you got to leave them outside. My wife is a very, very smart, very, very mellow person, and she went berserk. Right? How many of you are dog lovers? No, no dog lovers in Mililani? Okay. <laughs> Here's what you do. In the event of an explosion, and before you can get inside, your number one concern is do not breathe the air and suck in any of that radioactivity. It's very important that you remember this. You must cover your mouth, use a hanky, use a hanky, or your hand, Breathe shallowly until you get inside, because if you suck in all of that radioactivity that's in the air, it's going to attack your innards. Not good. Okay? If you have an open sore or cut that's exposed, you must cover it, because the radiation can get into your body that way and it'll attack you by penetrating any open sores you have. So what are we suggesting? You must get inside as soon as possible. If you are caught outside, cover up as best as you can. Long sleeve, hoodie, mask, glasses, long pants, and socks. <laughs> Which, which I never wear, but you got to cover up, okay? If you are contaminated and you're exposed outside, don't worry. You can decontaminate. Here's how. Next. If Uncle Joe comes to your house and he's pounding on the door and you've already sheltered in place, and some of you don't like Uncle Joe, you might say, leave him out there. <laughs> but for those of you who are, are humane and actual have common sense, let him in. But this is how you have to do it. You tell Uncle Joe, take off all your outer clothes. Okay. Throw it down on the ground. We'll take care of that later. But the first important thing is you got to get him in. So take off all his outer clothes, cover him up, take him straight to the shower, 
nice shower, shampoo on the hair, fresh, clean clothes, and he's good to go. You do the same thing for Buster Brown, right? You got your dog outside, cover him up with a towel, bring him in, put gloves on your hands, cover your face because he's going to splash, right? And then you give him a nice, nice bath, okay? After the bath, he's good to go. So don't ever listen to anybody that tells you you got to leave Buster outside. Right? And I don't know about Uncle Joe, but <laughs> that's your decision. All right. Next sheet. We're telling our schools, depending on where they're located, there are two phases to a nuclear detonation and Many people don't realize this. The phases go this way. The detonation comes. The impact is what I just told you. It's like an earthquake and a hurricane altogether. You have to find the place in your building or your house that is the safest spot to be. And by safe, I mean falling objects, right? the buildings are shaking, the glass might be blown out, all of those kinds of things like an earthquake does. Okay, so when we train the kids, earthquake has two parts too. It's the duck and cover. You gotta get under something, you gotta cover your head, cover anything that can get hurt from something falling. So we, we talk with people that live in wooden houses. Where, where is the best place to shelter for phase one? The strongest structural end in your house could be under the stairwell. Okay. A little cubby hole, get into that area. But how long do you have to stay? Only until the earthquake shaking and trembling and buildings. When that's done, now you're in phase two. What is phase two? Sheltering from the radiation that could come in. And that's why we have this. Okay. Just in case some of the windows have been cracked or because you have an old building and the seams around the windows aren't tight fitting and things can come in. What we want to do is use the plastic sheeting. I have some samples up here. You can get this at City Mill, get them in a big roll, pre-cut it to fit the size of whatever windows you need to, mark them, and keep them handy, right? So what we're telling our schools is, preschools that maybe have 50 or 100, find the sp safe spot in their school that is the best place to shelter for phase one. It might be the same place, it might be different. So we have some schools that have a really tight fitting place, but they can gather and have their children there just for that amount of time until the quaking stops. Then they move all of the children into another place, it's the safe zone for the radiation and they might pick one or two classrooms and do all of the sheeting to protect anything from coming in, okay? In your house, this is your homework. <laughs> you gotta go home tonight and figure out in your head, where's my safe zone number one? Where's my safe zone number two? It could be the same, but in many, many cases it's not. Why do you want to have a second phase? Because you want to be in a more comfortable spot. It can be bigger. You can have access to the bathroom and to the kitchen to get food. Rather than staying in a small cubby hole like you should in phase one. Does that make sense to you? Am I making it clear? Okay. Two phases. Prepare for both. It'll make you a lot more comfortable. Okay. 
So we just did a shopping mall. And the shopping center now understands that when they have guests coming through that shopping center, the stores cannot kick them out of their store. It's not acceptable that people won't accept it. Now the shopping mall realizes they have to have a safe zone area. And so I've, we've gone through it with them, we found their safe zone, and now this is what the stores will do. They might be a million dollar diamond store, right? They're not gonna let people in to shelter in that store. They take them with them, lock the store, and tell their customers and their guests, follow me, we're going into the safe zone. It's a lot better than kicking them out into the parking lot, right? Okay. All right. Any questions? You're not smiling. I thought you would feel better. <laughs> All right. Here, here's what we do. In order for you to have a belief that you're not helpless, in order for you to feel a lot calmer, you have to have in your head that you have a little more control than you do now. And here's how you get back your control. We deal with a lot of families that have more than one child. If an event happens, the first thing in your head is, do not rush to pick up your child. Your child is in the safest place possible. They are sheltering in place in the school. There's no safer place to be. So get that out of your head that you're going to drive 120 miles to try and get them. No. Leave them there. If you have two children, you do the same thing. And now you and your wife don't have to fight over who's going to pick up whom. Now the kids are covered. You know they're safe. You are going to be reunited with them when the time is appropriate. And I'll tell you when that is usually. We'll go over that. But now I got to figure out what to do with father. Okay. Why do men do more risky things than women? Who 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 thinks men do more foolish things than women? Be honest, yeah. Because men are stupid. The probability of a couple doing something foolish is so high when it's the guy, right? So here's what we need to do. In a family plan, you take away the risk. In our family plan book, it tells you exactly what you need to do. The children are in school and they're safe. So you have a diagram and you have everything you need to make sure your family knows. Where is father working? How far is it from where you are, which might be home or your, your working place? Okay. Your plan tells you exactly what father has to do and what you have to do at a certain time in a crisis. We now have the kids taken care of. They're at school. Leave them there. You have no communication. You all understand that, right? If that comes, or in any crisis, you know, <laughs> in Hawaii, only one electrical grid has to go down and the whole island is out. You know that, right? If you lived there for a while. So we're not going to have communication. You're not going to have your cell phones. The antenna will, be not, will not be working. You will not have landlines. How are you going to communicate with your husband 
if he works 10 miles away. At a school, we're saying the way to communicate is with a two-way radio. But they can communicate because it's in a small area. But if your husband or wife is 10 miles away, you can't talk to them by two-way radio. So what do you have to do? You can't read each other's minds at that time, but you can certainly remember what your plan is. That's what you have to have pre-scripted, pre-planned. Every time there's an emergency, doesn't need to be the nuclear, right? Could be the hurricane, could be the tsunami, anything, power outage. If you got the plan, you're gonna be a lot more comfortable and a lot less panicky. Right? Here's something that you probably don't realize. You all must have an outside Hawaii contact. What am I talking about? Remember, I lived on Kauai when Iniki came, right? No communication. But I had a landline through a fax machine, and I called my sister in California. Now she knew where my wife and I were, and she could contact all of our children wherever they lived and let them know mom and dad are fine. Okay. We couldn't reach them. They were worried sick thinking we were gone in Iniki. Right? And the other thing now is if you have more loved ones on the island, like your children, and they each can somehow get a message to auntie on the mainland, She's going to be your local contact. She's going to tell everybody, this is where Johnny is. This is where Susie is. This is where mom is. Wherever you are, you've got a focal contact outside of the area that is completely shut down. Red Cross is going to come in, and they're going to be able to, and, and you know, the National Guard came in to Kauai after Iniki, and they set up phone booths that you could use and then you would start calling and making contact that way. It's really important. Communi communication is top priority, and the communication of having a plan so the kids know what you're going to do, your husband knows what you're going to do, and you have it all pre-planned so you can sleep at night. Okay. This is Mililani. We have a, can you hold this mic for me? Hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, huh? Okay. A little higher. Oh, okay, good. We have emergency guideline booklets that we created for all the neighborhoods. This is Milanani, we got Waipahu, we got Pearl City, we got Kailua. And this is what we encourage families to do. This is an emergency guideline. You keep it in your house, flip it up. You got all the important numbers that are appropriate to your neighborhood. This one has all the Mililani contacts, fire, police, whatever you need. Then, whatever the event is, it could be tsunami, it could be fire, it could be chemical hazard, you just keep flipping the chart, and whatever it is, it tells you in shorthand what you need to do, okay? So this, along with our family guidebook, is how we make people more comfortable and less panicky in the event of a crisis. I, I gotta apologize to you, I'm, I'm doing the old man shuffle up here, you know, but my, my hip is hurt. So I can't sit down and I can't stand up straight. So I apologize for that. All right. Does anybody have any more questions that you want to? What we're going to do, um, you, you typically, I, I wanted to let you know that we try to stick to the basic hour that we have. So we're going to call the program in, in about five minutes as an officially over 
but we're going to ask any of you, because we'll stay as long as you have questions. And, and oftentimes at these gatherings, we have couples and families that want to know what to do in their house, and they don't want to ask me in front of the crowd. So we'd be happy to do that. We'll stay as long as you have questions. And then you can all come up and look at all the different neighborhoods we have, and then the red books. And my colleague, who I forgot to introduce you to, um, and you know, I can't, I wouldn't be able to do this without him. He is a 40 year risk management professional. He's the guy that signs off if a hospital, all the major hospitals, all the major hotels actually have a safety plan. And if he doesn't sign it, they can't get their insurance. <laughs> That's why he's so important. But nobody knows him because of that. The only reason they know him is because he's an all-star quarterback from St. Louis. Okay? So before Marcus Mariota, before Timmy Chang, before Tua, Elton was the all-star quarterback. He played against the legendary Charlie Wittemeyer. And uh, some of you are old enough to remember Charlie and, and Norm Chow when he played at Punahou. So. Can, can you all give Elton a hand? He's back there doing all the hard work. <laughs> okay. All right, so if we don't have any formal questions that everybody wants to input, oh yeah. Uh, email me and we'll send you some stuff. Yeah, we often get um, people that want, want to get more information, and we'll, we'll be glad to give it to you. Okay. One of the things we want you to do, though, as I told you in the beginning, is you've got that handout. Make sure you share it with your family and friends, and if you uh, work for a company and you want more information, we have an email. I've got cards up here for you. You know, Let people know we, we're doing these presentations almost on a daily basis now. And um, my priority is always working with schools and churches. Um, we're getting too many calls now from the businesses, and um, I'm upset at the businesses because they still have not taken the step. Uh, I take an informal poll, and I, and I go to see my friends at the bank. I go to see my friends at Long's and all the different stores, and I ask them, well, did they come up with a plan for you guys yet? And they tell me, not yet. So. We have a problem that way, okay? Businesses have to step up and make sure their employees and their staff know what to do so they don't get the flack. When customers are in a panic, they can't find a supervisor, they can't get a hold of their uh, higher administrator, and then they're stuck, okay? All right, good to go. Thank you so much for coming. We'll be up here answering questions, and you can see Elton about the books and things. Okay. Oh, okay. That, that's good. Sorry, did I miss that? <sighs> L, show us the monitor. Is it up there? Depending on where ground zero is, and we're assuming it's going to be in the area of Pearl Harbor, the radiation levels are going to be different depending on where you're located and where you live. And what's the best place on the island to live again? North Shore, <laughs> West Side, East Side. So in those areas, the radiation level is going to be way lower than it is in Central, downtown, in that area. Common sense tells us that, right? How many hours does it take for the radiation level to dissipate 90%? 70. Okay. Now, if you're in a school in Hawaii Kai and you don't want to wait for the state to do the all clear, our assumption is the state is going to wait to send the all clear out when? <laughs> You're laughing. 
Do you think they're going to send it out neighborhood by neighborhood? They, they can't. They're going to be overwhelmed, right? So if you can determine by yourself what the radiation level is, you can certainly, and this is what some of our schools are going to do, in Hawaii Kai, they probably can reunite your children with the parents in a few hours. Right? Do you have to wait till the all clear comes from the state, which means most of the island is all clear now? Probably not, if you have the ability to do that. Okay. So many of our schools are in pockets, niche pockets. Their parents live very, very close to the school. So if they're within five minutes of the school, they're going to pick them up right away. Or after they get a sign from the school that they can come and get them in two hours, in three hours, whatever that might be. Okay. We're asking our schools, especially in those pockets, to make sure they have supplies and things on hand at least for two to three days in the case of the maximum level that they might have to shelter. But why are you sheltering? Some people forget. <laughs> What is the reason you're doing something? If you forget why you're doing it, the reason you're sheltering is to avoid the radiation. If the radiation isn't there, why are you still sheltering? Common sense. The radiation level is down, the school should reunite their children, your children with you. They belong with you. And sometimes parents come to me and say, we are not leaving our kids for two weeks. You've heard that before, right? And we advise our schools, they are not leaving them for two weeks. Be prepared. They're going to come and get them. You got to be ready for it. And so they're designing ways to reunite their children with the parents okay. in as smoothly and as effective way that they can. Now, the two weeks, that's on you. You're supposed to have two weeks, at least two weeks of supplies in your house, not the school. Why do you need two weeks of supplies? Because Costco might be out of toilet paper and rice. The airport might be closed down. The ports might be closed down. There are no places to get supplies. That's why we're recommending that people have supplies. Let me tell you what happened in, on Kauai after Iniki. Foodland was fantastic. So the neighborhoods where I lived, Foodland gave all their food that was going to spoil because of the power outage. Right? So all of our neighborhoods, we had um, cookouts, barbecues, steaks, everything that was going to spoil, they gave to the people, and that's how we coped. <laughs> no water, no hot water, but we had charcoals. We could, we could charcoal steaks. Right? And the premium thing that everybody missed, y you won't believe it, was ice <laughs> and diapers. So th those were the days when Island Air used to fly into Princeville, and I was able to catch Island Air back to Honolulu, and for all of our neighbors, I always brought back diapers, and bags of ice. I'm getting a field. So if there are no more questions, we're gonna close it down formally and then anybody that wants to will answer more questions and, and come up and see our neighborhood stuff, okay? Thank you very much.